Okay, thanks. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I don't know what Milton Friedman would think of cryptocurrencies, but I think he would be intrigued by it. And uh, thanks. And uh, I have a story which I, I think is an optimistic one with regards to the future of crypto economics. Um, so as a lot of good stories, this one starts with media hype. This is how I got into the area of cryptocurrencies. My background is in quantum physics and quantum information theory. I'm a theoretical physicist. Uh, but last year, together with some colleagues, we were noticing that there's uh, a lot of hype about how quantum computers could be destroying cryptocurrencies, particularly Bitcoin. So we were seeing headlines like this, quantum computers will destroy Bitcoin, quantum computers can rock the world of Bitcoin mining, lots of fancy graphics that have really nothing to do with anything. And uh, they were telling you know, stories about serious loss of money. So you know, Bitcoin right now is worth about $160 billion. And if suddenly there were these strange machines that were gonna come out, maybe being from the Chinese, that were gonna steal everyone's Bitcoin, this would be a you know, tremendous loss. So, well, we decided to take a look at this problem a little more carefully. It's, there's some really funny stories here that's worth having a look at um, about the big crypto bust from quantum computers. So, we thought we would take a look at this problem scientifically to kind of break through the hype. So we did that, um, yes. Uh, but the story starts really with this white paper that was posted by an anonymous person going under the, the name or could person or persons, Satoshi Nakamoto. In 2008, there was this white paper posted about a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. And since this was posted online, uh, next slide. Yep. Just a few months afterwards, there was version 0 0.1 of the Bitcoin software posted on SourceForge. Now, the, the strange thing is that no one actually knows who Satoshi Nakamoto is. If you go just a little bit further down on the slides, we can know for sure that it's not Elon Musk. <laughs> <laughs> but. We still don't know who it is, which makes it all a very mysterious project. And still a lot of people don't understand how Bitcoin or more generally blockchain works. Um, uh, next slide. But it's been tremendously successful. So there's a plot just starting from uh, 2013, May of 2013, where the, the value of Bitcoin was, was minuscule up to now where, well, as of today, it was something like 100 and 40 billion. There was a, been a dip recently with its peak in December of last year. But overall, cryptocurrencies are worth about $340 billion. Many people think that this should go up to a trillion or beyond in the next year. We'll see. Um, so next slide. Well, how does all this start? Actually, there's a really nice way to understand the principles behind Bitcoin. And it all goes back to efforts to combat spam. So this goes back to a, 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 a preprint that was posted in 1992 by a couple of computer scientists, Cynthia Dwork and Moni Noir, who were upset about the fact that they were getting bombed by spam. And at that point in time, it was like 200 a day, which is trivial now. But they wanted to find a way to combat this. So uh, next slide. <clears throat> so their idea was, well, let's try to find a way to make it expensive to spam. Now, how would you do this? Well, you know, there's one way, which is what was proposed by Bill Gates many years ago, and that is to just make people pay money to send email. So you could have, make everyone pay a fraction of a penny, and then if you're gonna send you know, millions and millions of emails, it'll end up costing you. But that requires some governance to set that up, and uh, you can't really rely on you know, other country is necessarily abiding by that. And so uh, this team proposed a way to impose cost to sending information. And it uses something called hash cache. So the idea is that you would, in the header of an email, contain some information like a timestamp and the, the, the address of the recipient, as well as some random numbers. 
And the random numbers have to satisfy some constraint. That is, when you apply a mathematical function to them, they have to spit out a certain value. In this case, it's a value that has many leading zeros. So we go to the next slide. And the whole thing is called a proof of work. So it's you're making the senders of email prove that they had to do some computational work in order for that to be a valid email. So it starts off with the sender who you know, has written up an email and they have a header with this, this date stamp, the recipient's address, and these random strings. And what you demand is that a function on that header, which is called a, a hash function, I'll describe that a little bit in the next slide. You demand that this hash function, which takes all these bits in and spits out another string of bits, has to have 20 bits that are all zeros. The, the leading 20 bits of the output of this thing have to be all zeros. And if that's the case, then that random string that followed the address of the recipient is considered a valid one, and then the email can be sent out. But the thing is that you would never know ahead of time what are those particular random string you need to attach to make it pass this test. So you have to try it over and over and over again. And so for this particular example where you require 20 bits to be zero, it would take roughly two to the 20, which is greater than a million attempts to make this happen. Now on a one gigahertz processor, you can do a hash in about a microsecond. So we're talking about over a second per email which is maybe not so bad for one email, but if you're sending, you know, you're trying to spam hundreds of millions of people, it becomes a significant cost. And of course, you can always push up the cost by just making sure that you have to even solve for more trailing zeros to be uh, in the uh, hash. The nice thing is that if it passes this test, the receiver who gets the email can easily check whether the sender did this proof of work because they just have to do one hash and check, oh, did that header pass the test? If it does, great. If not, you throw that in the trash. Uh, next slide. So yeah, just very briefly, this mysterious hash function is just a thing that's doing a bunch of operations, elementary operations, it's called a nonlinear function. So it, it makes sentences that in English language or any other language have a structure go to something that looks very random. So for example, if you were to take these two sentences, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, the hash will spit out this you know, complicated looking string, which looks very random. And if you were to just change one letter of that sentence from dog to cog, the output string looks entirely different. This is called something that's called a high entropy function. Very, very sensitive to the initial input. That means it's very hard to work out which sentence corresponds to the output of this hash. And that's a very important key to making these functions secure. It's easy to compute them one way. It's very hard to compute them the other way. So it's very easy to work out the hash of a header. Very hard to work out what was the pre-image what made that hash be spit out. And that is the key to security of this hash cache protocol and also to the security of Bitcoin. So next slide. So what Bitcoin does is it takes the idea of hash cache and applies it to digital currency. What you do is you want to allow for transactions, but you also don't want people to copy your digital currency. Digital currency is just a string of, you know, of bits. So you want to make it very hard for people to either copy the currency or fake who they are, pretend they're spending your money when it's, when it's someone else's. And this is enabled using the principle of hash cash together with the principle of blockchain. So basically, you can enclose these, these things with headers, with their hashes, but you want to make it so that they're tied together in a chain. So each, each block of this blockchain contains information like timestamp and this random string that you would have on the header of Hashcash, 
but it also contains information about the previous block. So when you want to add a new block to the chain, and this new block will enable you to verify transactions, to actually make a transaction happen so that you send maybe 10 Bitcoin to your friend, in order for that transaction to occur, you also have to solve one of these difficult problems. And not only that, encoded in the difficult problem is information about the previous block on the chain. And that means that you can't change the blockchain without it showing up when people try to do their future computations. So this is a very clever idea about Bitcoin, that it ties together this computational hardness of proof of work with the immutability of a chain. And those two facts together give you a way to have an economy, a crypto economy, where you can have legitimate transactions occur, know that they're not being spoofed, and also there's some kind of inflation proofing because the way you actually release Bitcoin into the market is by the completion of verification of one of these blocks. So if you make it hard enough to verify, it builds in some, um, you know, some slowness to the release of Bitcoin currency. And Bitcoin is set up so there's a finite amount, total number of Bitcoins that will be released uh, you know, over a long period of time. It's roughly going to be about another 100 years when most of them will be completely released. Okay, next slide. So just to, where I came in with colleagues is, again, about this media hype about, oh, quantum computers are going to break the security of Bitcoin. And the premise behind that was that we're relying on proof of work to make Bitcoin transactions safe because it's very hard for computers to solve these problems to verify transactions. To do these, these hash operations over and over and over is very slow. But it is the case now that people have come up with algorithms for quantum computers which can do much op many operations much, much faster. And uh, while we don't have quantum computers at a full scale now, this is a picture of a 50 qubits quantum computer at IBM. And the growth rate is, is quite significant. In fact, there is a quantum Moore's law associated with the growth of quantum computers. And so you might worry that you know, if you're trying to store your long-term savings in something like a cryptocurrency, maybe in 10 to 20 years, it's not going to be safe. And so we took a look at these two questions carefully. The first, can quantum computers break this proof of work problem, do it much, much faster, so that it, they can basically beat other computers to transactions and take over the market? And second, could they crack the digital signatures, which affirms that you're sending your Bitcoin to a particular target recipient? So uh, we had a look at this problem. Uh, next slide. And <clears throat> this is summarized in this paper with uh, colleagues Argawal, Lee, Santa, and Tomo Michael. Um, and you can download it for free at the archive at this web page. Um, next slide. So the first thing we did is look at quantum computer attacks to Bitcoin mining. And mining is this process where you want to verify transactions. Once the mining is successful, then the transaction is completed, and the person who mined also gets a reward in the form of Bitcoins. Well, in the end, doing this mining operation is one big computation. And even if it's on a quantum computer, you have to do a bunch of actual physical gates. In, in the papers you'll read in our community, you'll see figures like this, which might look kind of mysterious, but it's re to represent a three-dimensional cube of quantum bits that are called qubits, and you're doing measurements on these bits and correcting for the outcomes with future measurements. And all these resources have to be taken into account, the time to do these operations, and also the amount of extra overhead you need to make them protected against errors. You need a lot more bits. Just like your iPhone, 
when it is doing calculations or sending and receiving information, there's always some errors involved and it builds everything into an error correction code. Quantum computers have to do the same thing. Uh, next slide. Well, so we looked at uh, the growth of the possibilities of quantum computers based upon current results and made some very rough estimates about a quantum Moore's law for the growth of how big these quantum computers will be and how fast they'll be and how precise they'll be. And then we crunched the numbers to include error correction for the particular functions you need to calculate to crack Bitcoin. Uh, next slide. And we came up with this kind of forecast for, for Bitcoin mining on a quantum computer. And this bottom axis is the date and the year, so starting around 2017. And the, the uh, vertical axis is what's called the difficulty, and that's a parameter you can set in Bitcoin currency, which tells you how much effort you need to put out in order to make a verification of one of these transactions. And basically, the difficulty we expect for Bitcoin network is in blue, and how hard a quantum computer would work is in the pink, and you see that there's actually a big gap. So what we found is that when you really go through the numbers, quantum computers are not going to be a threat to Bitcoin mining. These articles were simply wrong because they didn't actually do the analysis. Um, so mining is not under threat by quantum computers. And actually we found a way to even make it less of a threat by doing a modification. Um, uh, next slide. There is, although, a possible attack to what are called digital signatures. So this is to prove that you are the actual one who holds the bitcoins that's sending them to the recipient. And this is assumed to be safe right now. And actually, digital signatures are used all the time when you send transactions over the internet with credit cards you're using a digital signature. And this is one thing that a quantum computer could attack. And we did the analysis on this. Uh, next slide. Uh, let's go to the next one more slide. <coughs> so a similar kind of forecasting. Here's the year and the time it would take in seconds to crack one of these signatures. And Bitcoin transactions are set so that you should have one verification on average every 10 minutes. So the difficulty of the network is set so that's on true on average. And what we found is that under using this quantum Moore's law with uh, the possible major improvements of quantum algorithms to crack signatures, that under an optimistic scenario, you should be able to crack one of these signatures within 10 minutes in roughly 10 years. So this is actually a significant threat. Not actually just to cryptocurrencies. In fact, if you were able to crack like the location of nuclear silos and so forth, this would be a real world threat. Um, but at least in cryptocurrency, it's definitely a threat. However, uh, if you go to the next slide, there's a rather easy fix which is to use what's called post-quantum cryptography for digital signatures. And um, we looked at some of the algorithms that allow for that. And this is actually something that could be fixed relatively easy within Bitcoin or other cryptocurrency networks. It might require a hard forking for some of them, but sometimes you've got to fork. <laughs> uh, next slide. All right. So I think we, we're, we're pretty reasonably safe in saying that quantum computers and that kind of future technology is not going to compromise cryptocurrencies. But one of the things you always read about with Bitcoin is it's a huge energy eater. It just eats up energy like mad. So this is a, a, a Bitcoin energy consumption relative to several large countries graph. And you can look here, that Bitcoin is consuming about 95% of the energy that the country of the Czech Republic is. And it's only going to increase. Not only is this expensive for energy, but it's completely wasted energy. Because all it's doing is it's computers continually computing hashes over and over and over again for nothing <laughs> useful other than to prove that they're doing something hard. 
This is a big complaint that's often raised about Bitcoin <coughs> and other currencies that use proof of work. There is, however, a work around this. Uh, next slide. Um, I, I should, let me, please let me know my time. Should I quit now or <laughs> are we? Uh, I, sorry, okay. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah, all right, all right. Do we only have a couple more slides? Um, so there is a work around this and that's using computer science. So just as computer science gave us the security of Bitcoin, it also provides a way to make Bitcoin useful. So there's a recent preprint that showed up last year which showed that by a somewhat complicated method, you can actually turn the problems that, that the Bitcoin network is solving into useful problems. So you could post a bunch of useful problems on a pool, miners could grab them, prove that they solved them, and then you would be able to have a useful output. Um, and this, just the last slide, uh, more recently, uh, been taking this connection between physics and cryptocurrencies a little bit further, and we've been applying uh, blockchain technology to start a new company called Qubit Protocol, which is using blockchain as a way to provide for a new investment platform, particularly for quantum technology startups, where there will be a governance involving a pool of experts as well as owners of cryptocurrency tokens. And we use something called a liquid democracy model, which I think is actually a whole other conversation which would be very interesting for this conference, that you can have teams of people working together with reputation points and those points giving you different voting power for things like investment platforms. Um, but I'm running out of time, so I'm happy to talk with anyone after later about that. Thanks. Well, first I'd like to thank Gavin for that absolutely brilliant presentation. I've, I've heard a ton of talks on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and never heard uh, what you talked about, about the origin of, of Hashcash and all that. So that was really fantastic. Um, I also want to mention just quickly that I think it is interesting to consider the way mining might be converted to some, I don't know what you call it, socially positive purpose. Um, although I, I'm always reluctant to, to criticize mining because uh, you, you, you actually do want resources expended in the production of money. That's actually an important <coughs> thing. And Satoshi, uh, in putting together uh, uh, the proof of work idea, which n nobody's been able to improve on that so far, um, actually had in mind, and the reason we call it mining, is the idea of gold mining, right? And so if you recall back in, in history, uh, the the early earliest and most compelling attacks on the gold standard was that, oh, it's all just a waste. Why do we have all these dudes standing around panning the rivers and digging into mountains and this tech all just to get gold, this is dumb, let's get rid of gold and just have paper. And, 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 and we'll uh, get some very smart people we can trust to uh, make sure that they don't print up too much of it, you know. <laughs> so. It didn't, didn't work out too well. So I, ha I have a, um, oh, I was going to tell you the one interesting solution, possible solution to this. And we don't know. The markets are fascinating. The markets are always surprising us, right? That's why it's good to look out the window, see what's going on out there, not think you can solve all the problems in your head. Um, I was uh, uh, tooling through this uh, completely failing uh, left-wing rag the other day, uh, Salon. And um, <laughs> pathetic, you know. But, but, um, but they have problems funding their website, so they, they're urging everybody to download the little, a little tool that lands on your, uh, it's normally considered malware, but in this case it, it, it was fine, uh, lands on your computer and, and takes possession of your computer just in little amounts to, to mine um, a coin called Monero. And, and that Salon itself would get the benefits, you know, in the form of <laughs> crypto mining. And in exchange for which, they wouldn't uh, push ads on you. So this is really interesting to me because uh, as a model going forward, I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know how it's worked out from Salon, actually. I've heard reports that it's doing, doing, they're doing, mining a lot of Monero just from people that are using the website. But if this is possible, you know, you'd actually have then within mining the possibility of a new way of funding the internet besides just advertising. It's possible that, that mining could actually be, end up becoming an economically imp important tool for, uh, for funding the next generation of, of web applications. So 
just throwing it out there. There's, there's ways that you can use mining for socially beneficial purposes. Okay, so I'm, um, I think I'm going to use my time just to kind of give a brief overview of, of the monetary uh, um, investment and utility features of, of, of crypto assets. But I want to ask a question because the answer is always different in every audience I talk to. Uh, how many of you in this room consider yourself an owner of some or another form of crypto asset? Okay, so that is not that many. And I find that unacceptable. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Um, I, I run the Atlanta Bitcoin Embassy. And the, 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 the Bitcoin blockchain world has a lot of, it attracts a lot of sort of groupies. You know, like they used to follow the, the, the Grateful Dead. Now they just follow Bitcoin meetups, you know. And, um, and so I went to lunch with a woman the other day who uh, has been at every blockchain Bitcoin meetup I can think of. She comes to every cocktail hour, is at every conference, she's hanging out, she's talking the talk, you know, oh, hash grab this, mining that, and, and what do you think about Cardano and proof of stake standards, and she, oh man, she, she could just talk all the time. It's a lot of gibberish, basically, but as you learn from the space, people get good at the vocabulary, not actually the understanding. Um, and so I, f I, I, but I began to develop a kind of sense when I talk to people whether or not they really have skin in the game. And so I just asked her outright, I said, uh, let me ask you, do you own any actual uh, crypto asset of any sort? And she goes, well, I, oh, in the sense of like actually owning it. I mean, like, do I, do I, do I, per do, like, I mean, I know a lot about it, but I mean, do I, can I say that I'm an, uh, well, I mean, I know, not in that sense. <laughs> so I was like, so you've been hanging around blockchain Bitcoin circles for two years now, and, and you don't have any. And she goes, well, I don't even have a wallet. Nobody even explained, by the way, she was dating, what, you know, a top player in the, in the Bitcoin field. Never, I, I don't know how to download a wallet. Nobody ever explained it to me. I said, what, what about, you know, Michael? Well, I'm embarrassed to ask him, you know. <laughs> he doesn't have time. Well, it's the whole thing is ridiculous because uh, I think the best way to learn about this new generation of technology is going to change the world and give us new money and change our relationship with the individual estate and thank God we're alive right now because it's all, it's all turning around. That's my own view. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a maximalist in the sense of like crypto. I think everything is going to change because of this stuff. Um, the best way to come to understand it and learn about it is to own it. And I don't mean uh, going to uh, a, an exchange and coughing up all your information and letting them hold your private keys. I mean downloading a, a wallet like Bread or Edge or uh, Bitcoin.com or uh, Blockchain.info or uh, to, 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 what's, what's your favorite wallet? Sem Samurai Wallet. Samurai Wallet, wouldn't you know? I d I've never even heard of that thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Download, download a wallet and then, uh, then talk to a friend or, or go to one of the many, many, many crypto faucets online and get your 16 cents or just whatever it is. It doesn't matter how much it is. Uh, you need to feel what it's like to use it. And this, I think, is the most important thing you could ever do for understanding crypto. Even I forget how awesome this stuff is. Uh, you know, like the other day, I... Um, I have a Bitcoin ATM in my, in my office, so, uh, uh, so um, well, that's, that's a little bit of a securitist route. But I, we, and, and this thing allows you to download any one of or uh, to buy any one of something like eight different cryptocurrencies. And, but I had to send a friend Dash. Now, Dash is this wonderful, uh, I guess you could call it a kind of a, a, a it, it was originally developed as dark coin, and then it just became sort of ever more improved. And it's, it's really a nice, interesting crypto asset with an alternative governance model that's it's not entirely decentralized, but neither is it centralized. It's, it's a fascinating coin. Anyway, so I needed to move about $5,000 in Dash. And so the guy was in my office, and so he just held up the phone, I copied his QR code, boom, boom. Uh, it cost virtually nothing and sent instantaneously. And I so every time I do that, I am overwhelmed at the beauty and the elegance 
the art the, and, and just the transformative power of, of cryptocurrency for the world. It's, I, I, f I feel it every time I use it is what I felt. First time I used it in January of 2013, it changed my life forever. It's what caused me to stand up and do a little dance around the dining room table thinking that, oh my God, we've actually done the thing that nobody thought was possible, which is to uh, manufacture, produce a new form of money that's secure, it's got all the properties of money, it's fungibility, it's durability, it's divisibility, but it adds things that gold never had, namely weightlessness and spacelessness, so that it can be uh, moved peer to peer, uh, uh, you know, anywhere in the world. So without any regard to geographic uh, proximity, and uh, it does so without the permission of, of governments and without the use of banks and without any kind of third party intermediaries. It's a freaking miracle is what it is. It's unbelievable. Like 20 years ago, nobody ever thought that somebody like this would happen. And when, when Bitcoin is first, I, I got a, a, a note from a graduate student at MIT in I guess it was October of 2010, he said, you should look at this Bitcoin thing. I read, read through the paper and truly it read to me like, uh, are, you under, are you some sort of um, you know, alchemist? I mean, this is, it struck me as obvious nonsense that you could ever have a money invented you know, out of pure code. And so I dismissed it. And I did dismissed it again the, the next year. And it wasn't until really, um, early 2013, really late 2012, that I began to think, okay, I might have been completely wrong, and this stuff is is the real deal. So it it and you know, there's so much I could say about this and and explain what's extraordinary about it. Let me let me just I don't have that much time, so let me uh, ex quickly explain to you why it is that cryptocurrency is an improvement on fiat money, and, and in a surprising way. Um, so what happened was that about 100 years ago, every government in the world nationalized money. It took, governments took possession of money, as they've tried to do for 6,000 years, variously, you know, done it and not. Um, but um, like in the Industrial Revolution, a lot of the currency that was used in England was actually privately privately produced, but the Mint shut them down. Like government doesn't like competition. Well, about 100 years ago, we got central banks all over the world. Uh, most governments managed the, the great achievement of having the one money and a sing single geographic reason, region called a nation state, and all that money flowing through the same banking system that was regulated by the center. Ta-da, it's done, it's great, but what happens when government gets hold of technology? Basically, they stop it from improving. Right? That's what governments do. Anything government touches, it like freezes. It's like the Iceman, you know? It's like nothing changes, nothing improves. So we've been using the same, same monetary technology for a better part of a century. We had one kind of improvement. It wasn't an improvement on our money. After World War II, we developed uh, sophisticated credit systems, you know, third-party intermediaries, all working on trust relationships and implying a certain amount of counterparty risk, counterparty risk every time you use them. But that was a kind of a, an improvement in our experience of using money, but it wasn't an improvement in the money itself. So we all thought we knew what money did. Money served two purposes. It was a store of value and a unit of account that facilitated trade, period. That's it. We know what money is. Stop talking to us about improving money. We've got the right kind of money, and that's it. And every economist in the world believed it. I believed it. Everybody believed it. Bitcoin comes along and says, you know, there might be a third thing that money can do. What if we build into the money its own settlement network, its own payment system, so that the money is not just a store of value, not just a unit of account, but also allows for the settlement of all uh, uh, exchanges uh, regardless of geography. So you don't have to be next to the person, you know, giving your, your dollar for, for a gallon of milk. You can achieve that same beautiful, finally settled transaction peer-to-peer uh, -peer anywhere in the world, between any two individuals. So that was the great innovation. And what it does is it, 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 it changes the way money actually works. Instead of having money and payment systems separate, instead of dollars and visa, 
or Euros and MasterCard or PayPal or Venmo and all these other things, all of which rely on, on, on trust, all of which rely on your, will, your ability to, to pay, your willingness to pay, your access to financial institutions, your, your financial means, your, your personal identity and so on. Just wipe all that out. Now you've got the ability to, in the internet age, use the internet for all, not just for looking at stuff, not for just for barter, but for real indirect exchange, high-end uh, uh, monetary uh, exchange anywhere in the world, while it, it completely without having to rely on these, on the third-party intermediaries. So this is the great innovation of, from a monetary point of view, that, uh, that Bitcoin uh, has given us. But I think it's just begun, and I'm just about out of time. So, um, but there are other factors, other things that you can do with the blockchain. Oh, I should just add that people ask me all the time, why is this stuff valuable? You know, is it a racket? Is it a scam? Is it a tulip mania? Is this, you know, just, just a bunch of millennials hoping to get rich? Um, well, the last thing is true. But um, it's because of the service that it provides. And in other words, the addition of that payment system, that settlement network called the blockchain, which is really just a, uh, uh, an, an audit trail of transactions that have taken place um, and, a, and a means of, ex of exchanging immutable information packets, um, that is the source of its value. If you could somehow put a, uh, a, a, a wall between Bitcoin and blockchain, Bitcoin would lose all of its value instantaneously. I mean, that's, that's, that's why Bitcoin developed a value in its first posted price uh, of October 5th of 2009. So what else can it be used for? I mean, now we have a smart contracting layer uh, with, with Ethereum that's recently been added to Bitcoin Cash. We have a lot of innovation taking place in the, in the space. We have 3,000 different crypto assets, some of which are used for um, raising money to fund certain utilities. Others uh, in the ICO market are actually managing to raise money for an idea. So in the future, it's very possible you could have a wonderful idea. You don't have any money for it whatsoever. You throw it out there to the global democracy of, of crypto economics and say, what do you think of my idea? Here's my white paper, whatever. Uh, buy my coin if you like it. Suddenly you can fund your business. That is amazing. You're liberated from banks and VC capital and all the rest of it. That's absolutely empowering for the entire world. Not to mention the fact that if we eliminate these third-party intermediaries, um, we actually uh, give n new opportunity to something like two-thirds of the world that's unbanked. I live in Atlanta, 40% of the public doesn't use uh, banks at all. But if you go to one of our 60 Bitcoin ATMs, there's a long line and a lot of very cool socializing you could do with those things at midnight, by the way, on Friday night. It's a lot of fun. Um, the final thing that's really, really important here, and this will be the last point I'll make, so much of the modern total state has depended upon this monopoly control of money. That's why we have gigantic governments. That's where World War I and World War II and every other war of the 20th century is how they were funded. That's why we have grim debt. Uh, that's why uh, savings have been gutted through inflationary economics all throughout the 1970s and so on. I mean, uh, uh, government monop monopoly control of money is the cornerstone of, the, of all oppression in the world today over the last 100 years. We don't have to replace fiat money. We just have to break the monopoly. And so I'm very pleased to announce to you and my friends today that we're very much uh, uh, in the process of doing exactly that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. That was a great uh, speech there on, on skin in the game and what we, what we can do by really breaking the monopoly on uh, money. So I'm going to be speaking about Bitcoin, not blockchain. So I uh, just want to get the slideshow up. So uh, just to sort of intro, one of the things that we're seeing right now is a lot of hype around blockchain. And I think it's really getting overhyped. So I'm going to try and bring that back to what I think the real value is and why. So, so the talk is Bitcoin, not blockchain. So it's being oversold. 
so you can see a lot of people talking about it and it's it's a lot of people just going bright shiny thing next bright shiny thing oh look it's now ai and machine learning and so on but really they haven't thought uh, clearly enough about what is a blockchain and why would you use a blockchain and really the real innovation in my uh, in my view is bitcoin so I'm going to try and, you know, this is a libertarian and mostly capitalist type audience. I'm going to appeal to your self-interest. What's in it for you? You can make a lot more money by getting into Bitcoin. Bitcoin could, okay, obviously it could be zero as well, but there's a chance it can go to millions. And I'm going to show just a quick calculation on how it could, it could go there. The other thing to consider is the market for money is so much bigger than the market for anything else because money is half of every transaction. So, what is global wealth in the world? It's around 280 trillion from this Credit Suisse report in 2017. How many Bitcoins have already been lost forever? Estimate is about 4 million. The total supply ever is about 21 million and that will only be reached in the year 2140. So currently there are about 17 million coins out there of which f about 4 million are presumed to be lost. What does that give us as a calculated value? Well, total global wealth, 280 trillion, divided by 17 million BTC, assuming the full supply is out. And it, this is likely to be a winner takes most market. So 80% applying a power law gives you, in today's terms, a value per Bitcoin of 13 million. That is what we're playing for here. So there's a really, uh, prescient comment here by Mencius Moldbug, who he mentioned in 2011, at the time Bitcoin was 90 cents. He, he basically made an analogy, it was like buying Manhattan for a quarter. So enter sound money. So I'm f uh, influenced by the School of Austrian Economics, and I believe what really, the real innovation here is sound money. And to really understand that, we have to understand what Karl Menger, the founder of the Austrian School, wrote in his uh, essay, The Origins of Money. And basically he's talking there about different assets compete on the market to become money. The one that is most saleable, the one that is best at storing your value through time and space, has a tendency to win out over other monies. So it's not that we're going to enter, enter this multi-coin world of having bread coin and milk coin and denta coin and whatever. It's really more like there will be one best money that everyone will coalesce onto. And how we'll get there is by looking at the monetary attributes. So this is a nice little comparison of Bitcoin versus gold versus fiat. And you can see that it, it doesn't win out on every single metric, but it's the most scarce and it has the most credible monetary policy. And that is what makes Bitcoin so much different and so much better than every other money. It is the hardest and most sound money we've ever had. So this graph, this graph is perfection. So this graph is the total money supply graphed out over time showing that it's, it's on an asymptote. And what this does is because it show, it pr it's credibly scarce, it means people are more willing to store their value in this thing over the long term. So let's compare fiat versus gold versus Bitcoin. So you can see in that top table, the average inflation rate or growth rate for gold, 1.7. The average rate for US dollar, 5.5. And I think the Australian dollar would be roughly similar as well. So what you can see is at the start, Bitcoin had a very high inflation rate in the first few years. But now in this, in this second table below, you can see now in the year 2018, we're at an annual growth rate of four, just under 4%. But once we hit the next Bitcoin halving, block, block reward halving, the inflation rate will go below that of gold, making it superior from a value storage point of view. This is the first time we've ever been able to have this level of scarcity because anything else, if you've read Julian Simon and if you understand what, whatever, is, whatever is in this world that we try to get, if we apply enough human effort, we can get more of it. We can find more oil reserves, we can find more gold, we can go mine gold in the asteroids and so on but we can never get more than 21 million bitcoins. It's been made that way through cryptography. And that really is the, the, the crucial innovation here. So you've got to think of, it, think of it from a stock to flow ratio. And so the argument that we would make is that 
for thousands of years, gold had the best stock to flow ratio because it was so scarce and because it is hardly, it hardly ever gets destroyed. So it had the highest stock to flow ratio, meaning the amount of new supply of gold is so limited. But look what's, what's happening with Bitcoin from the year 2025. It is going to massively eclipse anything else in terms of stock to flow ratio, meaning it will be the most marketable. It will be the thing that people would want to store their value in. So sort of bringing it back to the blockchain point, the reason we use a blockchain is that it's a very specific technology that enables censorship resistance. If, you're not, if you don't need censorship resistance, you likely don't need a blockchain. So what I believe we're seeing is a lot of people selling it up about this blockchain for trade finance and blockchain in the corporate sphere and so on, but they're not, they're kind of, they're sort of doing like cargo cult reasoning. It's like these people who think that just by recreating one piece of that, but not recognizing the overarching reason why that it was built that way or why this technology was built in such a specific way, they're just trying to sort of claim the benefits without recognizing what actually gave it that benefit. So in order for Bitcoin to succeed, it has to, fa it has to avoid where gold, what gold failed at, which was it got centralized. It got co-opted by governments. Because gold is stored in vaults, it was easier for governments to go and exert control over those vaults and such change the, the way that we would trade. But with Bitcoin, that Bitcoin is a game changer in that sense because it enables anyone to store their Bitcoins in their own vault, in their own private wallet with, where they control the keys and they may verify and send out their own transactions. So, blockchain hype. So you can see there's a little Dilbert cartoon and he's talking about, well, how's blockchain gonna influence our strategy across all our product lines? You know, and you're getting all this talk of, um, you know, I recommend the purple blockchain. It's got faster CPU, guys. So, but uh, here's the reality, right? Blockchains are just overhyped linked lists. There's not necessarily a need for everyone to store every possible copy of the transaction and validate every transaction unless you've got a very certain specific need for censorship resistance, as I was mentioning before. So... Here are some of the problems. So as I was mentioning, it is a very specific technology. It's designed to be government resistant. That is the key sort of point here. And that is why with, the, with Bitcoin and the blockchain, everyone stores every block, which is a set of transactions. Um, but if you were to try and implement blockchain into a corporate environment somewhere, you're, you're just massively increasing the cost to transmit, validate, and store all that data. Now you've got to store it on, say, 10,000 different nodes instead of once or twice with a back, once in a primary location and maybe a few backups. You know, and there's additional in difficulty in updating and maintaining this sort of software as it has to be backwards compatible. It's hard enough to scale in a centralized system. Imagine how much more difficult it is to try and scale in a decentralized system without a token that incentivizes people to actually mine and run Bitcoin software, which is another thing with Bitcoin. And lastly, many blockchain technology solutions, so you, you hear people marketing things like, oh, well, you could verify that this diamond on every level of its um, supply chain was not you know, using slavery or so on, but you're still trusting whoever entered into, the, whoever put that record into that database. You've still got the problem of garbage in, garbage out. So it doesn't there's a lot of kind of talk about, oh, it removes trust, but does it really? I, don't, I, I think I'd be a bit, more, a bit more skeptical on that. So, yes, there are a few examples that, you know, you might have seen on the news. So ASX Settlement and HSBC have talked about trade finance, and you hear about various examples here and there. But I think, ultimately, many of these examples probably could have been done cheaper without a blockchain. And really, the, the gain probably just came because they were using some kind of legacy software that just wasn't using modern technology of databases and backups and access management and so on and so forth. So, yeah, that's basically the point there. Th now, they could use cryptography and they could use some other kind of public key cryptography or give you a receipt and, do, and design their system and architect it, engineer it in such a way that they don't need a blockchain, but they can achieve a similar result much, much cheaper. Um, so 
your personal alternatives. Well, at a personal level, buying and holding Bitcoin has returned something ridiculous, like four or five hundred percent return over the last four or five years on average. And from a libertarian standpoint, Bitcoin adoption will do much more to limit go government spending and wars because the, re the sad reality is governments have funded their spending through inflation. <coughs> and by use of Bitcoin, you are sort of removing that monetary control from the government and thus the government would actually have to provide you value or it would de you know, massively decrease or disappear. And we would use other mechanisms to do what we you know, currently have government now for. So, the conclusion. History shows it is not possible to insulate yourself from the consequences of others holding money that is harder than yours. So I'll just leave you with that. And um, if anyone's interested, you can uh, check out my blog or my Twitter, at Stefan Libera. Thanks, guys. Trap for a young players in this, this caper is don't go forth when half of what you're going to say I, is... I stole all your stuff. <laughs> yeah, you guys... <laughs> but that's all right, such is life. So I'll keep it thankfully brief, and I want to talk about three sort of key ideas. Uh, and it's to do with government's interaction with, uh, with cryptocurrencies as we see today. Why are they interested in, in restricting the use of cryptocurrency? Uh, what drives economic value? And who's going to win the cryptocurrency wars? So first, there's one thing that can kill technology better than anything is basically poor government policies. And as we've seen for most of this year, actions by in, in, the Indian, South Korean, Chinese and a host of other governments to try and restrict the use of uh, cryptocurrencies has, has caused the price of Bitcoin and, and others to fall. Now, this is just a classic case of what's called the bootlegger, uh, bootlegger and Baptist play. So what are governments doing? They're acting as both a bootlegger and a Baptist. And what do I mean by that? Well, the Baptist is someone comes out and talks about why they're doing all of us a favour by introducing this regulation. There's, evilness, there's evil in the world and the government's there to help you out. And, but underneath it all, behind the scenes, there's another ulterior motive where some group, some interest group, benefits from these regulations. In the case of cryptocurrencies, it's clear that the Baptist and the bootlegger is the government themselves. So why do I mean by that? So both the, all of the governments, the Indian, the South Korean, Chinese governments, they're all running around saying, well, this is a bubble. There's all these people investing here. We want to protect our people from, from the, uh, the, the inevitable fall in, in the value of Bitcoin. Well, when you go around saying we're going to ban the use of Bitcoin, guess what? You destroy the value of Bitcoin. And so they're actually, even though they're arguing at one level they're supposedly doing it for investors, they're actually causing the very problem in the first place. Uh, they've also run the, the great line that, oh, it's, it's a whole bunch of uh, evil uh, smugglers and drug runners, etc., who are using this as a currency rather than average people. What they don't talk about is their bootlegger side. And as uh, my uh, 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 former, earlier speakers have, have mentioned, the government gets a lot of benefits out of running the money supply. And they've, uh, they don't talk about the fact that money itself has no real intrinsic value. In fact, in reality, no asset in, in an economic sense has intrinsic value. All, all value in any asset is actually determined by what you and I think about it. So, the government, the Australian dollar is just a, an IOU from, the, uh, from, from our government. And it's only worth something if we believe that the government can back that IOU. And we know all through history there are so many examples of where governments haven't been able to back it because they've debauched the currency by printing more and more money. The poor Venezuelans at this very moment are, are, are understanding that fact. The, 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 the store of value of their money has just fallen in a heap because of actions by the government. And so you can see here, this is a, this is a play by governments to say that Bitcoin is bad but, and, and our money is good. But our money is used all the time by drug runners. I'm pretty sure that the biggest use, uh, 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 users of cash in, in, the, in the Western world are, are, are cocaine smugglers out of uh, places like uh, Colombia. 
that there is no doubt that cash is used for the very same things that they're arguing Bitcoin is going to be used for. Now, uh, as I said, I'll try and make this brief because most of the co uh, discussion I was going to have has already been spoken about. I, w I wanted to have one uh, slight go at Stephen's uh, um, discussion. And I, while I, I agree with the idea that cryptocurrency itself may be a great winner, but putting on my years of in being an investment advisor, picking a winner is the, is the, is the difficult issue. Now, there is, there's a really good idea, there's, there's a lot to be said for Bitcoin, but I, I like to e explain this idea in the, in the context of Google. Uh, some of you may be a bit uh, young to believe that there are, were actually other o options other than Google, but there used to be AltaVista, there used to be AskGs, there used to be uh, Yahoo was used. There are all of these different types of search engines. And at the time, ex ante, none of us knew which of these is going to win. And so all I would say if you are thinking about investing in the cryptocurrency world is that ultimately, as Stephen said, there's generally a, a big winner and then a lot of losers. Uh, you, you've got to be pretty confident you're picking the right one because it's, this is very much a, either it's worth zero or it's worth a lot kind of caper. So you need to sort of take that into account when you're taking investing. And putting, again, putting my investment hat on, this is where you might diversify your, your portfolio of cryptocurrencies and maybe not bet the farm. But if I put my gambler hat on, I kind of like trying to bet the farm once in a while. And, and if you pick the right horse, you're going to look pretty good. So uh, other than that, I'll, I'll leave it to the floor. Thanks.